Well, hello, thank you and welcome to everyone for joining us on this lovely sunny Thursday. It's my great pleasure to introduce a dear friend and colleague, Dr. Charles Inslee, Senior Lecturer at the University of Manchester. Um, the, the blurb is what it says on the tin for, the, for the, the page linking you to this event. So rather than give you a long and lengthy introduction of his many achievements, uh, I'll hand straight over to, to Dr. Inslee himself for his paper on Queens and Elite Women in the 10th and 11th century art and Atlantic Archipelago, a comparative perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Lindsay. Can can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. I'll start. So uh, my talk this evening and the, the project from which it's drawn represents the picking up uh, of the threads of research I started a few years ago and then put on something of a back burner during three years as head of department uh, at Manchester. In essence, this project looks at gender, elite women and the dynamics of power across the Atlantic archipelago, here understood as Britain and Ireland, across the later 9th, 10th and 11th centuries. We might characterise this period as the Viking Age. It encompasses the raids and settlement across the Atlantic archipelago of the Vikings and the emergence of new, more structured political hegemonies across the same space. For the period I'm most deeply concerned with, the period from around 880 to 1020, we can see some of these wider hegemonies uh, moving to sharper focus. Uh, so if I have next slide, please, Nicola. <clears throat> what is today England was increasingly dominated uh, by the dynasty of Alfred the Great, whose power base lay in the Kingdom of Wessex uh, in the sort of South Thames area of England. During the later ninth and first half of the 10th century, this family extended their control over the Midland, Midlands Kingdom of the Mercians, as well as parts of Eastern and Northern England that had been settled by and ruled by Scandinavians since the last few decades of the ninth century. In what is now Scotland from the mid ninth century, what by around 900 became known as the Kingdom of Alba was ruled by the dynasty of Kined MacAlpin. Although riven by dynastic infighting, uh, to quote Alex Wolfe, men with strange names killing each other, um, this dynasty dominated Scotland until the 11th century. This period also saw less enduring hegemonies emerge in Wales and Ireland. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, since the seventh century, Ireland had been dominated by two dynastic confederations, the Yonachta in the south and the Inyal in, in the Irish Midlands and north. Again, there was much intra-dynastic rivalry within these confederations, a problem exacerbated by the arrival of successive Scandinavian groups in the ninth centuries, uh, who established themselves in key coastal locations, most notably Dublin, Waterford and Limerick. <clears throat> Crucially, these Scandinavian incomers and the communities they constructed mercantile, wealthy and connected to the rest of the Scandinavian world, provided the resources for ambitious regional kings to challenge the existing patterns of hegemony in Ireland. In particular, the 10th century saw the rise to, uh, rise to beef, uh, a brief uh, pan-Irish dominance of a hitherto minor dynasty from the lower River Shannon area in southwest Ireland. Uh, this dynasty, known uh, as the Dalkash, uh, later the Ibrian or Ibrian, uh, the descendants of Brian, would come to challenge the dominance in particular of the Inyail under one of the great heroes of Irish history and indeed legend, uh, Brian, Brian McKennedy, uh, better known as uh, Brian Baru. And we'll return to this dynasty later. So the key question my project seeks to ask is whether it's possible to write about insular queenship and more broadly elite female power in the insular world in any meaningful way in this period. Um, this project is still uh, rather fluid, so what follows is really a series of questions and thoughts about how one might construct a framework uh, in which to think about queenship and elite female power, followed by a couple of case studies that I think illustrate some of the issues. And it's emerged out of a, a sort of uh, coming together of a number of my existing interests. If I have the next slide, please. So the, the why I'm doing this, in other words. So first of all, it's a biography of Athelstan, first king of the English, 924 by 939. Uh, and an awareness that by producing another royal biography, I was reinforcing a historiographical tendency to view early English history exclusively through the prism of the lives of men. As I was writing the biography, I was also increasingly aware of the people who are as important as my subject, the royal women around Athelstan, his half-sisters, his aunt, and above all, his stepmother, the Dowager Queen Erdifu. Second, the commemorations, including an academic conference, of the 1100th anniversary uh, in 2018 of the death of someone uh, a few of you might have heard of, uh, Ethel Flad, Lady of the Merchants. 
And if you haven't heard of her, you know, watch watch Bernard Cornwell's uh, Net, Net, uh, Last Kingdom series on Netflix, which will give you a wholly and completely inaccurate and erroneous impression of Athelflaed. Anyway, uh, she died in June 918, and she's the subject of the image from the 12th century uh, for the title of this paper. Uh, Athelflaed, a daughter and almost certainly eldest child of Alfred the Great, is a deeply interesting individual in all sorts of ways. Um, but it is her exercise of political power in Mercia in the last decade of her life, plus the transmission of that power and rule to her daughter, Elfwyn, that has attracted most comment. As I say, she's also featured in the Netflix serialization of Bernard Cornwell's Last Kingdom novels, and is in, uh, and sorry, and is in the rather dismissive words of one inevitably male historian, and I quote, the current poster girl for strong women doing it in a man's world. Uh, there are many, many things wrong with that comment, as we shall see. Third, comparative work on the cultural and political dynamics of the Irish sea world in what we think of as the Viking Age. In particular, the comparative aspect of this project is based around the idea that the Irish sea constituted a culture province, that it is a zone of interaction and shared cultural connections, and that the period covered by this project saw those connections and interactions intensified by the impact of Scandinavian activity. Moreover, the marriage and kinship ties created by Scandinavian adventurers with native dynasties in both Britain and Ireland also provide a further context for the exchange of ideas and experiences of female power. This work has also been stimulated by the work, this project has also been stimulated by the work of a largely but not exclusively North American group of scholars on elite women across the central Middle Ages, which was published in 2019 in a collection uh, edited by Heather Tanner. The thrust of this work is that while historians since the 19th century have pointed out individual examples of exceptional medieval women, exceptional women were in fact almost the norm across medieval European society. In other words, uh, we really do need to reconceptualize the exercise of power in medieval Europe in ways that does not treat its exercise by women as somehow aberrant or uh, exceptional. And finally, all of the above made me wonder what a narrative of English politics in the long 10th century might look like if it was written from the perspective of uh, the spindle half, to use a phrase that appears in the will of Alfred the Great. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and there's there's the quote uh, from, from uh, Alfred's will. Uh, that he bequeathed his land on the spear half, a spare the half, and not on the spindle half. Um, and it would be interesting if, if we uh, built a narrative around three overlapping lives of three royal women, rather than the ten men who ruled England between circa 870 and 1040. Next slide, please. So there you see that the same uh, period is covered by the three lives of Ethelflaed, um, Erdifu and uh, Elthrith, uh, as is covered by every king from Alfred to Ethelred the Unready. This idea, uh, an alternative history of the 10th century, if you like, was the focus of uh, an unsuccessful Leverhulme bid back in 2018. Since then, though, the project has grown from one which pure, was purely focused on England to one which seeks to put England into a comparative frame with both the rest of the Atlantic archipelago and also perhaps the rest of Northern Europe. Now, the history of queenship and more broadly that of elite female power in the Middle Ages uh, has attracted a, a significant amount of tension over the last 30 or so years. And much of this attention has been focused on the period after circa 1000. There has still been, though, plenty of work on elite women in the pre-1000 period, especially in the continental European context, with Simon MacLean's uh, 2017 book on Ottonian queenship, only the most recent example. Even English queens and elite women have been a recipient of scholarly attention, with pioneering work by Pauline Stafford uh, from and since the 1980s, uh, blazing a trail that others have followed. There is consensus that across much of Western Europe, queenship acquired an increasingly institutional form across the 9th and 10th centuries, with the increasing formalisation of royal marriages, institutions such as dower, the increasing intercessory role of queens, and an increasing formalisation of titulature. Nonetheless, queenship was not an office by any modern terms, and the language used to describe it in our sources was frequently elusive and fluid. Now, much of the work done on English queens and elite women has been done in comparison with continental Europe. And there is, of course, considerable logic to doing this. 
The source base is broadly similar, laws, charters, chronicles, biographies, hagiographies. And from the mid-9th century, the West Saxon dynasty in England was connected in increasingly complex ways to the dominant dynasties um, in Western Europe, the Carolingians and the Ottonians. Looking at English queens and elite women in this context clearly makes sense. However, what I want to do is actually look in the other direction, as it were, and see if it is possible to look at and think about queenship and elite female power comparatively in an insular context. Can the sorts of developments we can see in an English context be seen elsewhere in the Atlantic archipelago? How far can we see the Atlantic archipelago as a whole participating in these wider European discourses of gender, power and identity? Are these questions it's even possible to ask, let alone answer? And there are some formidable challenges to overcome, first and foremost of which is the nature and quantity of the source base. English and continental European historians are relatively well served with a broad range of sources, ranging from law codes, land charters and other documents, through chronicles, secular and sacred biographies, to biblical commentaries, for instance, the medieval uh, fascination with the Old Testament figures of Judith and Esther, and a vast array of poetry. If we turn our attention northwards and westwards, the nature and quantity of sources contracts significantly. We have very few charters surviving anywhere outside of England before the 12th century. The legal material is much more sporadic and much is later. And the same is true of chronicle and analytic material. And we're certainly struggling to find those sources that allow us to see queens and elite women in action, as it were, as patrons uh, and protectors of religious houses, as intercessors in legal matters, and as key figures at royal courts. The difference in source material is also qualitative as well as quantitative. For Ireland, we have a range of analytic material, much of it later in date, as well as legal and prescriptive material in vernacular and exegetical texts, or sorry, in, and vernacular exegetical texts. In Wales, we also have a set of analytic traditions, the surviving versions of which, so the Latin Annales Cambriae and the vernacular Brita Tuzogium, surviving post-1100 manuscript contexts, as well as a significant corpus of legal material, including the laws of court. Again, these largely survive in 13th century or later contexts. There is a substantial corpus of pre-12th century charters from Wales, but these are overwhelmingly concentrated in the southeast, in the great early 12th century compilation known as the Book of Llandaff. Scotland provides the most challenging source environment, with nothing or virtually nothing contemporary with the 9th and 10th centuries, and a narrow range of chronicle and analytic material from the 12th century, 12th century or later. There are also a handful of property, early property records in the Book of Deer and in the Leven Priory material incorporated in St Andrew's Cartulary that relate to the mid 11th century, but that's about as far back as we can really go with that sort of material. So these different patterns of source material survival also raise the question of whether we are in fact trying to compare apples and pears and actually looking at radically different societies across the Atlantic archipelago. On one level, there clearly were significant differences between, for instance, Irish and elite, Irish and English elite society in this period. It seems clear that by the 10th century in England, elite women could hold property independently, and the same does not appear to be the case in Ireland, where even royal women did not independently own land and could not alienate property. On their deaths, it reverted to their male kin. Then again, the Scottish property records I've just mentioned in the Loch Leven material, where Macbeth Adma Finlach's Queen Groch makes an appearance, and the Book of Deer do hint at elite female property ownership. Uh, next slide, please. And even office holding transmitted through the female side of the family. So just, just little hints there of a more complex uh, set of social, social situations and social practices around uh, women, uh, land holding, uh, lineage and power. Um, despite these variables, though, I think it's still worth asking what light can we shed on the trajectory of insular queenship uh, across the 10th and 11th centuries and how we might shed that light. So the following discussion will use a shared space, the Irish Sea, as the point of connection between insular elites. But there are certainly other avenues uh, worth exploring and which I do intend to explore. Writers across Western Europe in the early Middle Ages had an abiding interest in Old Testament queens and powerful women, including writers in Britain and Ireland. As Stacey Klein has shown, Writers use biblical and legendary women 
as a means of commenting on a range of contemporary anxieties and concerns. Commentaries on women such as Judith and Esther allowed writers such as the English homilist uh, Elfrich, writing in the 980s and 990s, to engage in a range of discourses around family, salvation and female power. This use of legendary and biblical women is very clear in an English context, but it can also be seen in an Irish context. In a recent article in Peritzia, <coughs> Elizabeth Boyle suggests that a number of old and middle Irish texts, most notably the treatment of Michelle, daughter of Saul, in the early Irish uh, quatrain of the Salt, or sorry, the Salt of the Quatrains, were responding to and commenting on a range of contemporary concerns about royal women, their loyalty to their husbands, and the impact of multiple serial royal marriages. Similar issues can also be seen being negotiated in the other texts of a similar 10th or 11th century date, notably the Middle Irish tale, The Wooing of Olvia. <coughs> and as we shall see shortly with the Irish Queen Gormala, at least one case where these concerns may have reflected and were grounded in contemporary realities. <clears throat> For the rest of this talk, I want to look at two case studies which might shed light on some of these questions. So next slide, please, Nicola. I will start with Ethelflaed as one of a very small number of royal women who appear in English, Welsh and Irish sources. I will then turn to another of my three 10th century English royal women, Queen Elthrith, and look at her comparatively with two other royal women of the late 10th and 11th century, or early 11th century. First, though, let's spend a little bit of time with Ethelflaed. Next slide, please. Returning to this is just a, a sort of brief uh, thumbnail sketch of Ethel, Ethelflaed's life. Returning to the question of the exceptionalism of politically active and powerful women and the way in which the sources frame them, what is most interesting about our accounts of Ethelflaed <coughs> is that our contemporary sources, our, our strictly contemporary sources, do not see her or her exercise of power for at least a decade as exceptional at all. Uh, next slide, please. One is reminded here of the 1892 Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Silver Blaze. In this story involving the theft of a horse, Holmes draws attention to the fact that when the horse was stolen, the guard dogs did not bark, thus indicating that whoever stole the horse was known to them. Uh, similarly, in our contemporary accounts of Ethelflaed and her exercise of political power, no dogs bark. Uh, as far as we can see, independent political power is unremarkable. Next slide, please. The notice of her death, aged around 50 in the set of annals known as the Mercian Register and subsequently copied into the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says, Heo ye for twelve nichtan er midan summer a binan tamar worthig, the ato than yere, thus the heo merchner and wield mid rich lafodoma held underwas, and who the lich lith binan glaucester on Thamist Portage, Sancta Petra's churchyard. She died at Tamworth, 12 days before midsummer, the eighth year of her having rule and right lordship over the Mercians, and her body lies at Gloucester within the east porch of St Peter's Church. The key phrase here is um, unwailed midrich lafodoma, having rule and right lordship, right equals lawful lordship over the Mercians. For the compiler of this annal, uh, possibly uh, a monk at Worcester, her rule was not problematic or exceptional, but right, and that she could exercise power that was semantically coded as masculine, lordship, or chafodon. As I've just noted, Ethelflaed appears in Welsh and Irish sources, which allow us uh, to establish some very important context for thinking about insular queenship. The first is that despite the ambiguity, ambiguities about her status, in English sources, where she is never ever styled queen, but lady or domina, or slafdia in uh, Old English, to contemporary insular commentators in Wales and Ireland, she was an un unambiguously a queen. Both the Annals of Ulster and the fragmentary Annals of Ireland and the Welsh text known as the Annales Cambriae describe her as a queen. The second is that to some extent we can see Athelflaed as the architect of her own historical memory through her presence in charters and through historical writing, 
that is the compilation of the text that I've just referred to, uh, generally known as the Mercian Register. Her presence in non-English sources is striking and suggests that there was a strong Western British Irish Sea dimension to her power. The death of her brother in Edward in 924, uh, in an English context, a much more significant event, does not get a mention in either the Annals of Ulster, the Fragmentary Annals of Ireland, or the Annales Cambriae. I'd say despite his much more significant presence in English historiography. The fact she is described as a queen, independently, as far as we can tell, in both texts, also suggests that for analysts in Wales and Ireland, she looked and acted according to their perceptions of queens. To the Annals of Ulster and the Annales Cambriae, we can add a third uh, and really quite problematic text, the so-called Fragmentary Annals of Ireland. Notwithstanding the numerous problems in the transmission and manuscript context of this text, it describes Ethelfile exercising rulership over the Mercians well before the death of her husband in 911, on account of his ill health. He was, according to the Fragmentary Annals, sick and close to death at that time. This included defending Chester from a Viking incursion in around 905-7, rebuilding its walls and negotiating a settlement with a Hiberno-Norse war band led by an individual called Ingemund. Although the Fragmentary Annals are a difficult text, there is some circumstantial episode, sorry, sorry, circumstantial evidence that the episode here, or the episode described here, the attack on Chester and Ethelfed's reaction to it, uh, took place. The Ingemund of the Fragmentary Annals account is almost certainly the Ogmund, uh, recorded in the Annales Cambriae, as having attacked Mesos Phalion on Anglesey. That Ethelfed was exercising rule before her husband's death is also suggested by the entry in the Mercian Register to her building of the now unidentifiable Burr or Burra at Bremersburg in 910, the year before Ethelred's death. Now, the point of this discussion really is that to some extent Ethelfed and her actions allow us to calibrate insular non-English perceptions of and expectations of queens and queenship. The second reason for beginning this discussion with Ethelflaed is that we can see her through contemporary sources in which she herself had significant degree of agency. She issued charters, some of which survive, both jointly with her husband and after 9-11 in her own name. In some respects the titulature in those charters is ambiguous, using the term domina, but at least one of these charters uh, adds what is in essence a by the grace of God clause to this title. Next slide, please. There you go. Ethel fled Juventa Superna Pietate et Largiente Clementia Christi Gubernacula Regens Merciorum. Um, so like all royal styles, this title, I would argue, represents a conscious attempt by Ethel Flad and those around her to present her power in particular ways. In this context, that rule over the Mercian kingdom uh, was entrusted to her by divine mercy, rather than, rather than through the gift of her brother or by right of her dead husband. And we can see reflections of this in the Mercian register, where on several occasions her actions are presented as being possible through God's grace or mercy. The retaking of Tamworth, the, the, the symbolically important Mercian centre of Tamworth in 914, was with mit Gordes for Yefendum. Uh, with God's forgiveness, effectively, while the taking of Derby and Leicester in 917 and 918 was mit Godes Fultuna, God's grace. It is also clear that the compiler of the Mercian Register did not find her or her exercise of Flafodoma and Anweald, lordship and soul rule, problematic in the slightest. Now, there's not space here really to do the Mercian Register justice. Uh, am I still being, am I still audible? I, I think I froze for a moment there. Okay, so there's not really uh, space here to do the Mercian Register justice. Although the text is in all sorts of ways rather enigmatic, it is clear that it represents uh, first a continuation of the or original Alfredian Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the so-called common stock, but one which takes that story in a Mercian direction. And it seems to have been originally compiled or composed in close proximity to the Mercian court, to the extent that Pauline Stafford has coined the alternative term the Annals of Athelflaed as a more productive way of thinking about the text. We cannot say that Athelflaed commissioned it, but it is very assiduous in how it presents her, and we can, I think, locate its production in a political and cultural environment of which she was the centre. 
Ethelflaed then gives us both a measure of the expectations insular writers may have had of queens, but also underlines the importance of how those queens engaged with and exploited the documentary environment around them. I want now to turn to our three later long 10th century queens, Elthrith, Emma and Gormla. Unlike Ethelflaed, all were unambiguously queens. They were also roughly contemporaries. Next slide, please. Elthrith was born in around 945 and died in around 1004. Like other queen, English queens of the 10th century, she was a member of a major aristocratic dynasty. In her case, she was connected to the influential and monastic reform-minded West Country family of Ordgar and Ordulf. Next slide, please. <clears throat> sorry, sorry, Nicola, there's going to be a bit of going backwards and forwards between these slides for the next sort of uh, few minutes. Um, Emma was born in around 985, daughter of Duke Richard II of Normandy, and died in 1052. She married Ethelred in around the year 1000 and was that king's second, or possibly even third, wife. Inevitably, we know least about Gormla. Next slide, please. She was the daughter of the Ephelan king of Leinster, Murchal Macfin. We don't well know when she was born, although she was old enough to have married the Dublin and briefly Northumbrian king, Olaf Kvaran, who died in 981, and provided him with a son, Citric Silkenbeard, king of Dublin on and off between 989 and 1036. And this gives us, therefore, a very, a very approximate birth date of somewhere in the late 950s or early 960s. <clears throat> Gormla died in around 1030, uh, according to the Chronicon Scotorum, which described her as the mother of the kings of kings of the foreigners, uh, Citric, and of the king of Munster, Donacha O'Brien. And we shall return to Gormla's marriages shortly. As well as being rough contemporaries, it is possible to locate our three queens in the same political and cultural spaces across their lives. Elfith was the second wife of King Edgar and mother of King Ethelred the Unready. So let's go back to your slides, please, Nicola. Brilliant, thank you. Um, she was also, until her death in around 1004, briefly Emma's mother-in-law, following Emma's marriage to Elthrith's son Ethelred in around the year 1000. Next slide. <laughs> uh, Emma, as is well known, also married Ethelred's successor, the Danish King Knut, and was the mother of future kings, Edward the Confessor and Hard the Knut, by both her husbands. And finally, there is strong, if circumstantially so, evidence that connects Knut to our third, third of our insular royal women, Gormla. Gormla was the mother of the Dublin king Citric Silkenbeard, as I mentioned, who seems to have been a client of Canute during the 1020s, and to some extent Canute's proxy in the complex Danish-Norwegian rivalries played out in the Irish Sea across the second decade of the 11th century. Some, notably Benjamin Hudson, have argued for a much closer link between Canute and Citric, noting that the Citric Dux witnessed charters issued by Canute in 1026. However much I, will, my, I might want this to be true, the balance of probability is this, this, it, this is not Citric Silkenbeard, but an English Earl of the same name. Now there are, of course, significant obstacles in comparing the lives, careers and political power of these three figures. The source material basis in particular is a problem. For Elthrith and for Emma, we are relatively well served with sources, in particular contemporary sources, as well as the standard narrative and analytic um, texts, so the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle basically, uh, both queens appear in a range of other material which adds to our understanding of them, their power and their status. Both, both queens witnessed their husband's royal actor and were thus engaged in some of the key political processes around royal patronage and exchange. Emma in particular almost always subscribed royal charters immediately after her husband and ahead of the archbishops and bishops adopting what was a new regnal style, Regina Humilima, most humble queen. Elfith also witnessed her son Ethelred's charters after a brief hiatus in the later 980s, and was certainly present in the witness lists for some of the most politically significant charters issued by an English king in the 13th century. So let's go back to the Elfith slide a moment, please. There we go. Um, Ethelred's so-called restitution charters. Uh, indeed, her reappearance in charter witness lists seems to coincide with what appears to have been a significant refashioning of Ethelred's kingship in a much more explicitly penitential way. And I think it's very likely that she had a major role 
in that process of reshaping the presentation of her son. As someone strongly connected to what we might want for convenience call the reform movement that gathered momentum in the reign of her husband Edgar, her brother was instance was founder of Tavistock Abbey in the 980s, she may well have played an important role in her son's attempt to rebuild his relationship with key churches, uh, Rochester, Abingdon and the Newminster Winchester, which had suffered at Ethelred's hands in the 980s. As Andrew Rabin has pointed out, Elthrith was also a powerful advocate for a series of churches that she had taken under her protection, and like her uh, continental contemporary counterparts, was fully capable of manipulating political, legal and documentary processes on behalf of her clients, whether lay aristocrats or religious houses. And in this respect, we can perhaps see her operating as much as a lord as a lady. Emma is similarly visible. So that's the next slide, please, Nicola. <coughs> Emma is similarly visible across a range of source material. As well as witnessing her husband's charters, although not at those of her sons, we can also see Emma as someone actively engaged in shaping the history around her, in particular the curating of the memory of her husband, Knut. The resulting text, at the encomium of Queen Emma, is a remarkable text in all sorts of ways. Although Knut is the unsensible subject of the, of the text, the, the text is really about Emma's attempt to shape the history of Knut's reign as she moved from being a queen to a dowager queen and the mother of two successive kings, but not Knut's immediate successor. The text and its construction show Emma to have been at the centre of a cosmopolitan multilingual court. Now, although we can't link Elthrith so closely to the commissioning and shaping of a historical text, um, <clears throat> her closeness to the reformer Bishop Ethelwald of Winchester and Ethelwald's praise of her in the account of King Edgar's foundation of the monasteries, a text composed at the same time as the great programme of the reform movement, the Regularis Concordia, it does make us wonder, I think, whether uh, we should not see her involvement in the commissioning of that account as she plays such a prominent role in it. Next slide, please. I think this is the last time I asked you, I need you to move up and down. <laughs> in comparison, poor old Gormler is very poorly served. We have no charters, or any contemporary analytic material for her. She features in the main Irish analytic collections, so the Annals of Ulster, the Annals of Tiernach, the Annals of the Four Masters, the Annals of Clon McNoise, and the Chronicon Scotorum, all in their current form significantly post-date the 10th and 11th centuries, although are generally held to have contemporary material embedded within them. She also appears, more notoriously perhaps, in a range of later pseudo-historical and propagandistic sources. The most well known of these is the early 12th century Kogad Goidil Red Galif, The Wars of the Gaul with the Foreigners, a highly partisan text about the events leading up to the Battle of Clontarf, uh, fought on Easter Sunday 1014, very much from the perspective of uh, the O'Brien or Ibrian dynasty. And we'll come back to the Kogad in a moment. Her descent is also detailed in the 12th century Corpus Genealogiarum Hiberniae, and she's also referenced in the 13th century Vita of the northern Welsh king Gruffith ab Cynan, who was via her son Citric Silkenbeard, a great grandson of Gormlas. Finally, she is a major figure in the 13th century Icelandic epic Brennunjal saga. All of these texts are late and pose major problems if we want to get at the historical Gormla. Now, the significant difference in the source material for our three queens may flag up significant differences in the societies in which they operated. And there is a certainly historiographical tendency to treat Ireland in particular as very distinct from the rest of Europe in this period. That said, I think it would be very interesting indeed to see how we viewed Elthrith and Emma if we only have the accounts provided by 12th century and later writers. And Elthrith certainly uh, would, would emerge much more poorly from that comparison. The absence of a body of charter material in which we can see Gormler operating is undoubtedly a problem. But one, I think, which we can perhaps obsess too much about, and I know Lindsay will raise her eyebrows at me saying, let's not worry about charters, uh, since I spent my entire career worrying about charters. Um, and, which, and I think it might tempt us into exaggerating the differences between 10th and 11th century Irish and English societies. As I remarked at the beginning, the queens we are looking at were all, to a significant extent, players in a single cultural and political space, the Irish Sea during the Viking or the Second Viking Age. So what then are the points of comparison we can make between our three queens? First of all, 
They were all married at least twice, were not their first husbands' first wives, and were mothers to sons by different fathers. Now, on one level, the multiple marriages of elite women in a European context is completely unremarkable. And yeah, so it's a banal statement, really. But it actually remains a point worth, work, worth making in this context. In outline, the life stories of Gormla, Elthrith and Emma actually look very similar. Elthrith had married before she married Edgar, while Edgar himself had married at least twice before Elthrith. Canute had also been married before he married Emma. Uh, he had been married to or had engaged in a relationship with the Mercian noblewoman Elfie Vu of Northampton. Like Edgar, Canute had fathered at least one son, Harald, the future King Harald I, by this earlier marriage. Gormla's first husband, Olaf Kran, had also fathered at least one son, the wonderfully named Dunyaran, or Iron Knee, uh, by Dunla, daughter of the northern Inyail king Dovnul Unil. Emma and Gormla seemingly married their first husbands because of the polit political capital they represented and the need of their new husbands to form alliances with their kin, the Ophelin family or the Ophelin dynasty in the case of Olaf Claren and the Dukes of Normandy in Ethelred's case. It is tempting to think that they may not have had much agency in these first marriages, but we should also perhaps remember that there were likely to be significant constraints on their husband's choice of marriage partner for both elite men and elite women the constraints of geopolitics and dynastic necessity were all-encompassing. As mothers of sons, though, <coughs> they may have had more political capital themselves on being widowed when going into their second and possibly third marriages. As mothers of future kings, we can see all three acting in particular ways, most notoriously with Elthrith's possible, maybe even probable, complicity in the murder in 978 of her stepson Edward the Martyr. Both Emma and Gormla, though, were mothers to sons by different fathers who then went on to become kings. Gormla seems to have been most aligned with her son by Olaf, uh, Citric, while Emma initially favoured her son by Knut, uh, Harder Knut. Indeed, her relationship with her older children, the Athelings Alfred and Edward, seems to have been cool, rather as Gormla's one with it was, or rather as Gormla's was, with her son by Brian Baru, uh, Donacher O'Brien. And Gormla's marriages are particularly uh, difficult to disentangle because of the sources we're dealing with. Uh, next slide, please. The 12th century uh, Corpus Genealogiarum Hibernae references her making three leaps into three leaps. Um, first into Dublin, um, second into Tara, and the third into Cashel. The first marriage is clear enough. Olaf Kvaran, King of Dublin, and uh, I think the most interesting Irish king of the 10th century. Uh, Alex Wolfe calls him the first Irishman to be king of Dublin. Uh, the third leap into Cashel represents her marriage to the Munster king and would-be Irish hegemon Brian Baru. The second is more problematic since this refers to the southern Inyale king uh, Moyle Shacknall. Beyond the corpus genealogium Hibernia, the evidence for this second marriage is slender. Moira Nefweni points out that there was scarce time for Gormla to marry Moyle Shachnal after Olaf's death in 981, before marrying Brian and producing a son, Donacha, who was old enough to be fighting at Clontarf in 1014. Her marriage to Moyle Shachnal is not mentioned in a number of her obits, nor in the text known as Banshankas. However, the annals of the Four Masters do mention Moyle Shachnal and name a son, Conacher, of his and Gormla in, his, in her obit. And the marriage to Moyle Shachnall is also referenced in the Vita of Griffith ap Cunnan, if in a rather garbled way, when Moyle Shachnall is her son. Now it's worth remembering that the Vita of Griffith uh, <coughs> is a text connected to her Dublin Norse relations. Griffith was a grandson of Citric Silkenbeard and thus a great grandson of Gormla, and it's possible therefore that the Vita preserves a memory of this elusive marriage, if rather lost in translation. For now, though, I will simply follow Maureen of Wayne uh, and suggest that the ma if the marriage to Moyle Shacknell happened, it happened, uh, probably did so after her marriage to Brian. The Conacher, uh, named in Gormla's obit, may have been the Conacher MacMoyle Shacknell active in the 1040s and 1050s. We can also see these queens as powerful royal agents in their own right. With Elthrith and Emma, this can be seen, as already noted, in the Charter Evidence and through texts such as the encomium of Queen Emma. 
Uh, oh, could I have the next slide, please? There we go. That's just a, a schematic of uh, gormless marriages. Um, these were women who played an active role in the shaping of their dynastic presence, but also the presentation of the dynastic pasts. Now, it's much harder to see this in detail with Gormla, but something that unites the later treatments of her for all their problems is that she was a formidable and politically active woman. Those later texts may have had all sorts of conceptual problems with Gormla's power, or more likely female power in general, but they did not deny it. Gormla, like her peers, was capable of acting vigorously in defence of what she saw as her interests, in particular as a mother. And the final aspect of insular queenship I want to explore this evening is how it seems to have been viewed in the 12th century and beyond. In particular, how the three or even four queens that have been the subject of tonight's talk were treated by later historiography. Ethelfled's treatment by 12th century writers seem to have been, seems to have been the most bizarre benign. Both William of Malmesbury and Henry of Huntingdon regard her with a measure of approval. There could be many reasons for this. Uh, but for the, the the fact she was not the mother of kings and could be, with a certain amount of wishful thinking, be seen as safely under, under the dominion of a more powerful male, her brother Edward, may have made her seem safe for those later writers. The other three, Elthrith, Emma and Gormler, were the subject of much more hostile treatment by later writers, although to a lesser extent for Emma. Elthrith and Gormler were both the subject of significant criticism by later writers. For Elthrith, of course, there is the implication of complicity in her stepson's murder, although it is striking that contemporary and early 11th century commentary on this was muted. But for 12th century writers, Elthrith was an archetypal bad woman, too grasping, too mindful of her own power, and deeply complicit in regicide. <clears throat> Some of this perspective, at least, comes from monastic writers who saw the monastic reforms of Edgar's reign as a golden sort of prelapsarian age and wrote Elthrith, ironically given her actual patronage of monastic, especially female houses, into the narrative of what a previous generation of Anglo-Saxon historians termed the anti-monastic reaction to Edgar's reforms. As, en as contemporary depictions of Elthrith show, of course, far from being anti-monastic, she was in fact a key part of the renewal programme of Edgar and his uh, Episcopal collaborators above all Ethelwald of Winchester. Gormler has a similarly negative reputation in later historiography. For the Cogad, uh, the, the Wars of the Gale or the Gale with the Foreigners, she was a hothead who was quite happy to provoke the quarrel between her brother, the Leinster King Mylmorda, and her husband Brian, that ultimately led to the Battle of Clontarf. And the Cogad makes it clear she was determined to side with her own natal family against her husband and her son. As Nivwayani suggests, the wife of powerful Munster and Dublin Dinaths she may have been, but it is as a Leinster woman first and foremost that she's depicted in the tale. She is a similarly disruptive figure as Cormlod in Brennan Jarl's saga. Again, she instigates the conflict between her son Citric and her former husband Brian out of a desire according to the saga, for revenge on her ex-husband. To this end, she urges Citric to kill Brian and is prepared to offer herself to the, the powerful backers of her son, offering marriage to both Jarl Sigurd of Orkney and Jarl Brodir of Man. As the saga says, next slide please, she was the most beautiful of all women and best in all those things that were beyond her own control, but it is said that she was completely evil in everything for which she had self-control. That's pretty damning in Diamond, really, of poor old Gormler. So Gormler has power in Brennan Jarl's saga, but in the post-Gregorian world, it is a twisted power rooted in her sexuality. This image of Gormler as a devious, manipulative and sexually voracious schemer is the one that has become embedded in wider Irish memories of the early medieval past and local folklore. Next slide, please. The prehistoric monument on Toon Tina Mountain above the town of Ballinar in County Tipperary, uh, not far from Brian Baru's palace complex at King Cora, just across the River Shannon. In fact, you can't see King Cora from there, but with, with good eyesight, you probably could see King Cora from there. Uh, but this monument is known as the Graves of the Leinsterman and supposedly recalls the betrayal and death of a party of men from Leinster, including the King of Leinster, at Gormler's hands. This seems to be a very, very garbled recalling of the tale in the Cogger, where Gormler provoked her brother, Moil Morda, King of Leinster, to defy Brian. 
All sense of the historical Gormla is lost in this folktale. What remains is a fossilised memory of the vicious, duplicitous schema of the 12th and 13th century texts. In conclusion, it's almost worth flipping the question I started with. How different was Gormla from her immediate con insular contemporaries? As I said, we might want to pose the question of what Elthrith and Emma might look like now if we were solely dependent on those 12th century Latin and vernacular histories emerging from England. The answer, I suspect, is not very different from the problematic Gormla that emerges from the Cogad or Brennan Yarl saga. As passive recipients of the disparaging views of later medieval male clerical writers, rather than queens actively shaping their presentation and representation and the construction of their historical memory. The argument advanced in this paper is that despite the apparent differences in the documentary environments in which these queens operated, Elfrith, Emma and Gormla look similar in all sorts of ways and acted in ways that seem actually normative of 10th and 11th century queens across Northern Europe. So, to conclude, <clears throat> in terms of next steps, the example I've just sketched out might form a case study for a, a larger book type project, thinking about contemporary and later presentations of elite women in power. I am, though, still feeling my way into what is, for me, a partially new field. I'm also anxious that even though I'm trying to A, centre women in our political narratives, and B, think about gender and power in more complex ways than much English historiography, I'm still fundamentally seeing women in relation to men as daughters, wives, mothers and widows. Is, the, is this problematic? I don't know. Should the conversation be less about the gendering of power than de-individualising it, seeing it as a collective, so seeing it in collective rather than individual terms? As always, uh, I welcome the uh, views and thoughts of people more knowledgeable than me. Thank you. You can put the final slide up if you want, Nicola. Thank you very much for an, an exceptionally interesting talk. Um, a lot of really fascinating threads to pick up on. And go, oh, we've already got our first volunteer. Oh, was that a clap or was that a? I oh no, that might. Be. I think it was a clap. There's a little hand up. Oh, um, that was a clap. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, there's a, uh, Hilary, is that a, a hand up for a question or is that a clap? Apologies, no, I was trying to offer a round of applause. Very easily done, uh, very easily done indeed. Well, well, give people a moment or two to gather their thoughts and start to, to think about questions. If you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. Otherwise, if you want to raise your hand via the little icon or by waving at me, uh, that's also fine. <laughs> um, but in terms of that, I'm, I'm not really quite sure to even what, which question to ask first. Um, but I'll take Cheers' privilege then while other people are gathering their thoughts. I'm really intrigued by so many things. It's very familiar to me, particularly from teaching, uh, of how, how difficult it is sometimes, how surprised students are to realise that there are um, that there's much more complexity in terms of gender and that in fact women were present throughout history uh, in many more ways than the sources sometimes let us see. I'm really, I'm really intrigued by this notion of, of, uh, of putting the question and of, of trying to use the process of thinking about sources produced in a later time period as a way of sort of working back to what, 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 what might have changed and so on. And it's a very, very handy way of trying to deal with some of the source issues with Big parts of the country, especially, especially Scotland. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just I'm really intrigued by this process of, of, of how do you how do you even do that? Sorry, that's that, that, that's not the question. Um, <laughs> but how do we get beyond uh, beyond this stereotype? Are, are there enough different characterizations, uh, distinct stereotypes of the archetypal evil woman? Um, that, that let us get back to a more authentic, original sense of, of who these women were on their own terms. Um, really even a very good question, I'm afraid. But I'm really struck by local examples too, that this, this, this relationship between history and folklore and how it passes into, um, it was very, very, very prominent in, in an example close to me. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it was, it was 
I mean, I, it was it was thinking about Elthrith that kind of made me think, well, what would happen if we only had the 12th century sources? Um, because they're really hostile to Elthrith, they're really condemnatory of Elthrith. But in the 10th century sources, she is, I mean, in the in the the depiction of Edgar in the Regularis or in the um the account at the start of the Regularis Concordia, she's a, basically a Queen Abbess figure. You know, she's actually lauded for her patronage of and protection of uh re religious houses for women. Uh, and she seems to be very much at the heart of that reform movement agenda. So it's how do we get from how you know, how have we got from that Elthrith to the Elthrith of um, you know Geoffrey Guimar or, or, or whatever? Um, now, obviously, there's there is the the death of Edward in 978 and the assumed complicity of of, of Elthrith in that. Um, it's her son Ethelred who benefits from that that assassination. Um, <clears throat> and it made me think, well, if you stripped away all that 10th century stuff, then then Elthus looks awful. And she looks awful like Gormla looks awful. So if you kind of reverse engineer the problem, do, you know, Gormla would look different. Um, and I suspect other women for whom we have none of those sorts of sources that allow you to see women in action. So as witnesses to charters or as commissioners of charters or as uh, commissioners of historical texts, um what would we you know if 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 we strip those out from from a lot of the women we know about how would they look uh, and you know so i got i got very interested in in trying to find out more about um groch um filia boita in and 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 macbeth had. um because it's not impossible that macbeth macbeth claim to being king in in uh 10 1040 is through through groch the surviving okay it's only like two grants that we have that survive that name them but it's, it's interesting they're joint grants which are not that common and are not very common in the early middle ages um and then i think it's in the book of deer some of the the, the implication that the the more mayordom of buchan can be passed through the female line um that i, think, I can't remember now the exact sequence but one more mayor of buchan seems to be the successor to the previous more mayor by dint of marrying his daughter um so just just I mean, little nuggets there that i mean we know otherwise diddly about scotland really before about 1050 uh and I, I have i have one of the questions i'm still wrestling with is do i put margaret into this conversation um if i do she'll be right at the back end of the period i'm thinking about um but she would be very interesting to do so because she's both scottish and, and english and in all sorts of quite important ways neither because she doesn't grow up in either Scotland or England. Um, and I have a colleague who does some very interesting work on Kievan Rus princesses. And if there's any influence on Margaret as a young woman, it's from Rus uh, and, and her, her time spent um, at the court of, I think it's Stephen or Bella IV uh, in Hungary. And he's married to, to a Kievan princess. Anyway, sorry, sorry I'm ran, rambling now. But um, yeah, so it... it it's how do we recover some of these women who who are there, um, but all we have really is kind of these sort of really negative folkloric remembrances of them, which must be built built on something. But what they're built on uh, is probably nothing very real. Yeah, ab absolutely fantastic little snippets. And it was a little snippet around Barghead quite recently. It was Nick Evans's most recent work on Barghead as as a hint of, of a, a woman. As a, as a prominent property owner um and uh, and she definitely looked at Fenella as well near me but um lucy lucy's got a question there's more a comment than a question just based on the things that you were talking about there i also found the idea of um sort of backward engineering uh, really interesting um, in terms of dealing with how you can strip away the later um to understand what's beneath it and um there's some really interesting comparisons, much later comparisons, I'm afraid, because that's where my 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 knowledge no, my knowledge sits. But in terms of um, work that's been done that might be considered quite similar in terms of the way that the 16th century um, histories that write about Scottish queens. So this is um, people like um, Bu uh, Buchanan and um, John Knox and all these individuals who are all writing about 14th and 15th century Scottish queens through the lens of Mary Queen of Scots being in power. And that's um, Amy Hayes has done some really interesting analysis of 
why the views on these queens seem to change and when they change and if we didn't have the charters where would we be kind of mm -hmm. so i just thought it might be quite interesting so that her phd was done at aberdeen right i'll, I'll follow up because um, i mean I, th I think it is yeah i think there is a, there is a shift in the 12th century i mean i've i've been very lazy and said basically let's blame let's blame gregory the let's blame pope gregory the seventh and and the kind of reform movement around uh you know the, the church which also you know, has a strong impact on, on lay society um and you know i don't i kind of don't want to get into the was there a golden age of anglo-saxon queenship and then after the norman conquest it's all gone downhill um i'm not sure that's helpful i don't think the normans particularly particularly uh to blame for any any changes in in in, in the configuration of female power but i do think um sort of 12th century writers seem to have a real issue around independent female power that is not there it's demonstrably not there in earlier writers and you can see this really well with the Ottonian material um you know some of the work that Sarah Greer and uh, uh Megan Welton have done on on Theophany and Adelaide uh, I'm never running rings around their men folk frankly uh I mean when Otto the second dies he dies in Italy um it's um you know they're in a really weak position uh and i, I can't remember the name it's it's another uh, another relation tries to you know maneuver himself into position and they they completely outwit him um and this is not this is no, there's no sense in the Ottonian records in, in vidikin or not in vidikin but in trotsvita or tietmar that they're, they're they're problematic figures um and actually, Tietmar's, Tietmar's obsession is not with the queens at all. It's with Otto the Third, who he sees as a anyway. Um, so yeah, I think you know, thinking that there is a shift across the 12th century. I think um, what causes that shift, I, I'm not so sure, and I'm, 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 and I'm probably being very lazy and just assuming it's you know clerical obsession with with clerical marriage and concubinage, kind of leaching out into um, lay society. But I think there's something going on. There was a question popped up in the chat, I think. There is indeed. And a, com a question from Jim. Uh, can you say more about Scandinavian sources, adding, adding more elements to the Scottish picture? Um, yeah, which ones? I, I, I mean, I'm, uh, Brendan Yarl Saga is the one I'm thinking of just because it deals with Gormla. Um, I'm not aware of the Scandinavian sources that might help me here, but if, if you are, please do. Uh, suggest them um i mean there's the figure of i mean shannon lewis simpson talks about the figure of um ord the deep-minded uh as a, as a kind of alternative way in which powerful women are configured in 13th century uh scandinavia or Icelandic sources so that i mean ord is certainly someone i want to spend a bit more time with perhaps but ord or held i suppose is how it is fascinating uh we're going to hand up and then i'll come to susan's question in the chat uh, yeah, I was just going to add to the Scandinavian sources. Um, mostly, I'm doing my my PhD right now in women and leadership in the Viking Age as well. So uh, what I've come across is the, the Icelandic sagas, of course, the King sagas are, are what's going to give you the most information yeah. on the, the leadership in women. But like you were saying, we have to come we have to come at it from this angle of it's written by, you know, post conversion authors who are trying to respect their ancestors, but also have a very solid view of women in that time. But the other source that I found really helpful is um, runestones. So some of them we can get a little bit of detail from, uh, like there's one in the Hasmir runestone, which commemorates this housewife who who ruled the farm, and that kind of gives us an idea of um, you, you, her her role on the farm as as the kind of leader governor and does that bring you know the the women outside into the the public realm and, and and that sort of thing so there's a lot of breaking it down but in terms of scandinavian sources yeah i'd say the the sagas for sure although those have been written in the 12th and 13th centuries or the rune stones are going to be yeah. your most original sources can i can i follow up can i follow that up with you after uh, you know uh, by, by email yeah absolutely brilliant thank you that's very helpful yeah excellent um susan has a nice question do you think Knut's wives ethel giffen and emma were treated differently or were perceived as different 
kind of queens or is the language around Emma because she comes from the Normandy tradition? That's a really, really good question. Um, and I think we slip into this model of uh, Elfie Vu as a concubine, Emma as a queen. Um, is that, uh, yeah, um, Elfie Vu never, never witnesses Canute's charters. So there is some kind of contemporary qualitative difference between Elfie Vu and Emma, um, where Emma does witness um, Canute's charters as, as Regina. Um, but then if Elfie Vu, I mean, at most, Canute marries Elfie Vu in 1014, uh, but he's marrying Emma in 1018. So he's set, he set Elfie Vu aside very quickly, I think, after becoming king in 1016. So in a way, the absence of charters issued with Elfie Vu as Regina is not as conclusive as it might be just because of the very very narrow time window um i don't know it's, it's, it is a good question um but it's it's elfie Vu's son who succeeds knut first uh harold in 1036 um and it's clear that knut sees no problem with um deploying elfie Vu and 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 her sons uh as part of his kind of uh control of his his empire in the late 1020s in Norway, um, I guess. I mean, the, I mean, yeah. The marriage to Emma anchors him, I guess, with with. Um, I think in I think in ten fourteen ten fifteen, Knut is trying to build support amongst the aristocracy of the Midlands. I think is what's going on there, which is why, and and a particular in particular, a family that had suffered very badly at the hands of uh, Ethelred and uh, the elderman of the Mercians, Erdrich. Strona. Um, so it's very, very strategic relationship. It's you know, here is a, a powerful family who are who have been given a bit of a kicking, who are probably not very happy with Ethelred, who are certainly not happy with Erdridge. And therefore, maybe, you know, that there is there is just political advantage in creating a, a base of support in the Midlands. Um, I think in 1017, 1018, different set of priorities, but whether that means that Elfie Vu is is lesser of a wife. Or not even a wife compared to Emma. I'm not so sure. Not sure if that answers your question. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And and Tara has her hand up. You're on mute, I think. So I am. Thankfully, that's the first time I've made that mistake today. Um, <laughs> I was really interested in your points about the relational aspect um, and how women are often viewed through the relationships with men, whether it's husbands or fathers or, or sons. Um, and one of the things that I've been looking at is trying to sort of look at whether there's a sort of a comparison between the masculine idea of friendship, political friendship um, that can be seen with um, between women in any cases. And I've, I've seen a few examples, but it's um, they're, they're pretty few and far between. So I was, I was really interested to see if anything you've looked at so far um, uh, sort of provides um, any insights into some of the female hierarchies that you might see um, within the courts um, and how they might be sort of negotiating those powers. We hear a lot about masculine hierarchies, but mm. not so much about female hierarchies. That's a, that's a really interesting and good question. Um, I don't think we've got enough material in an English context to mm. do that. Um, the the mother-in-law daughter-in-law relationship i think is an interesting one mm -hmm. and certainly in the ottonian world uh it's quite striking that otto the great's mother that michthild kind of disappears from the scene when otto marries edith in around 929 uh and then reappears on the scene after edith's death in 946 uh, and then kind of disappears again when otto marries adelaide so I think it may, whether it's a case that there is only space for one queen at court, mm -hmm. uh, one can't have the, 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 the dowager queen hanging about if there's a queen present, mm -hmm. but if there isn't a queen present, then it's perfectly okay to have a dowager at court. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, Elf Elfrith witnesses her son's charters and her son is definitely married at the time mm -hmm. she's witnessing them. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, um, the will of Ethelred's son, the Ethling Athelstan, 
died mm. in 1014 or thereabouts, preserved in the archives of Canterbury Cathedral. In the will, he thanks his grandmother for bringing him up, mm. Frank Selthrith, who's dead. Mm. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Simon, Simon's writing a, a note in the chat as well. Um, which is interesting. That suggests there's something going on there. This is so. This obviously is before would have been before the marriage of Ethelred to um, Emma in around about mm. thousand one thousand and two. Mm. Um, and Ethelred's first marriages are are not entirely clear who 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 is married. Suggesting that one of his wives is, or his, perhaps his second wife is, the daughter of Elderman Thored of Northumbria. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think we can get hints of, as it were, relationships between women at court, mm. um, queens and and, and mm. dowager queens, perhaps, mm. that suggests that relationship could be a problematic one. Mm. Yeah. Um, but the, rela the relational thing, I think, is difficult to to, to mm -hmm. navigate beyond. Um, mm. And the, I mean, what I've been thinking about a little bit is some of the work that Theresa Ear and Fight and uh, and Lucy Pick have done on Spanish. Queen's bit of Lucy's book on Uraka, and that really, um, so not not Trees around right, um, Ellie Woodacre's work, um, <clears throat> where actually what we should be thinking about is collectivities exercising power, and sometimes there's a woman woman at the apex, and sometimes it's a man, and in a way it's not it's less important who's at the apex than that there is a kind of collective around it mm. that can that can work, and I, I'm kind of quite intrigued by that as a way of thinking about rather than kind of ending up with a kind of zero sum binary of, of female power versus male power. Mm -hmm. And if women are powerful, then somehow, you know, you know. Um, but I'm still feeling my way through that, I think. Okay, thank you. Excellent. I've just noticed the time. I think we call Sally for our last question of the evening. Um, well, it wasn't a question, it was sort of a comment to add to um, what you were just talking about, because one of the things, <clears throat> you have to forgive me, still still long COVIDing everyone, um, so um, I've been thinking about, and what really helped me when I was thinking about the relationship dynamics between women, given, um, as you rightly put, during my period, there's a lot of... Um, uh, grumpy men writing about women badly, or not writing about them at all. Um, was basically I kind of mapped um, the relation, the generational relationships um, and the um, intermarriages, um, uh, sort of, you know, well, multiple marriages and where we had them, the births and the deaths and actually started looking at who was alive when other people were around, which sounds a bit, a bit sort of simplistic, but actually, it turned out to be a fascinating process because I was able to map not only where people were, but also who they were with. And when you looked at the power structures of the women from my period um, and um, um, and particularly the people that I'm studying, like who they were influenced by, which circles they were mixing with and who was alive at the same point. Because when you look back at the sort of things, you, you get this impression that um, say, for example, um, Queen A was alive ages before Queen B, but actually you, when you start looking at how um, the, the dynasties are working and how things are overlapping, you actually find quite how narrow the gaps are. And, and again, that falls into that mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, but also sort of half-sisters or um, stepmothers or um, and all those kinds of things. And actually, I just found that really useful to literally put it on paper and look at it as a kind of block and see. Mm. Um, it turned out to be really intriguing, and you can kind of map the power that way. I think it was it was a it was a good good thing to do. Yeah, I I agree entirely. Thanks, Sally. Um, I mean that kind of, that's kind of where I started <coughs> back in twenty seventeen when I was thinking about Ethel Flad, and then thinking about well who who did she know, uh, and that's what got me thinking about well if you if you look at the people whose lives with which she overlapped. And suddenly you, you collapse about 130 <laughs> years into three lives. And Elthrith, and sorry, Ethelfad will, will have known, will have undoubtedly known uh, Edward's wives, her, her brother's wives. She'll have known Eadifu. Um, and Eadifu is the one person I haven't talked about this evening. And she 
partly because she's the hardest of the Anglo-Saxon ones to really get a handle on, but is in some respects actually the most interesting because she is has a very, very long life. She is born in a, probably in around 902, 903. She dies in 966. Um, she is, and she's a dowager queen at the court of her stepson, Athelstan. Um, she's dowager queen at the courts of her son, Edmund, and her, certainly her son, Erdred. Um, she will have known both Ethelflaed and Elthrith. Um, because Edgar marries Elthrith before Edifu dies. So it's just that those kind of overlapping lives and the people that, you know, these queens and queenly figures will have known. I think, yeah, really interesting. Of trying, of, as, you say, as you say, sticking it all on a piece of paper um, and, and then drawing lots of lines and, and confusing myself. But um, yeah, I think it's a really productive way of thinking about it. Okay. Absolutely. Sorry, Lindsay, I didn't mean to interrupt you again. Just wanted to say thank you. And it was really, really enjoyed it. Very interesting. Well, thanks, Ali. <coughs> well, I think we should wrap it up and, and, uh, and let Charlie go and uh, have a have a hot drink. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for attending uh, and asking such fantastic questions yeah. uh, and for the very lovely comments in the chat as well about sources to follow up on. Um, Thank you very much for coming uh, coming out. The recording will be available via the Centre for History website in, in due course. And I hope you'll all come along to the next one, or we might see you in the future. Uh, but before we go, can we thank Charlie once more vigorously with a show of an emoji hand?